Matthew chapter 5, the title of the message this morning is Extra Mile Christians. Extra Mile Christians. Let's look together at God's Word, verse 38. Jesus is speaking here in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and he setteth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Perhaps no part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount has been so misinterpreted and misapplied as is this section of verses. Specifically, the first half of the text. It's been used as a proof text, so to speak, to promote passivism and anarchy and a host of other positions that, frankly, the text does not support. Even the Russian writer Tolstoy based a great number of his novels on this series of verses, particularly the novel War and Peace, which carried the idea that police and military and other forms of authority needed to be eliminated in order for peace to truly prosper. Coming to the verse and suggesting that we are to resist those of government authority. Yet Jesus has been very clear that he did not come to abolish the law, but rather to fulfill it, which in part creates within his followers a desire to respect and obey God's law as well as earthly law and authority. These verses are really a good summary, in my opinion, of the theme of the entire Sermon on the Mount. That citizens of God's kingdom will live a distinctively different life from that of this world. That they will be people who are characterized by going the extra mile. That's what I've entitled the message today, Extra Mile Christians. Now, what does that look like? What are some of the examples that Jesus identifies for us as extra mile Christians? Christians, there's four of them. I want you to write these down in your notes. Number one, extra mile Christians resist retaliation. They resist retaliation. Look at verse 38, if you would. Jesus says, you have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So here's the deal. The law states in Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, and Deuteronomy 19, this exact phrase that Jesus is bringing to our attention in verse 38. In fact, not only does it quote this exact phrase, but it actually goes a little bit further. Let me read one example to you in Exodus chapter 21 and verse 24. The law says this, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and then it goes on, hand for hand, Foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Of course, the law goes into more situational details in that chapter as well as the others that I mentioned for individual and specific crimes. But the point is this, that the punishment is to always match the crime. 
That's the point of the law. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot. The punishment is to always match the crime. Now, it's important to understand that this law was intended to be a judicially imposed process. In other words, breaking the law of the land has consequences. And those consequences are to be enacted by governing authorities, not by the victims. And the thing to remember is the heart behind the law, that it served as a protective policy in keeping punishments from being greater than the crimes committed. In other words, the penalty of cutting someone's hand off is not to be paid by beheading the criminal. And there was a danger, no doubt, in any society to enact punishments far greater than the crime actually committed. So God comes and says, an eye for an eye, not a head for an eye, all right? There has to be a balance here. There has to be a proper response. And so the law served in heart to protect the crime being committed. It also served as an opportunity to prevent further crime. In other words, think twice before you choose to murder another human being, for your own life will be the payment for the crime that you commit. And so the heart behind the law was to protect the punishments from being far greater than the crimes committed and also to prevent further crime. Of course, as in all of these issues that Christ has been addressing in the Sermon on the Mount, the people had abused these laws. They had twisted them. In the case of this law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, many would not allow justice to be properly followed in the courts, but would rather take this as a personal matter, taking matters in their own hands, which was, as a result, elevating the relational tensions and crimes. So it wasn't the court's responsibility to enact the policy of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You take my eye, I'm going to take yours because I have the right to do so according to the law of God. That's how they taught it. That's how they believed it to be. And this is where Jesus' point comes into play. He is not telling us as pacifists would or anarchists or Tolstoy or anyone who wants to misinterpret this passage. He is not telling us that nations and governments are not permitted to legislate justice on criminals. That's not what he's saying. This is about one thing, personal retaliation. That's the purpose of what Jesus is teaching, personal retaliation. Look at it in verse 39. But I say unto you, resist not evil. Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. All of us as human beings are vulnerable to hurts. We are susceptible to injustices. And when those hurts have come, we have the natural tendency, all of us do, whether you want to admit it or not, we have the natural human tendency to personally retaliate and enact vengeance on those who have wronged us. And you believe they did that to me. I'm going to have the last word, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The problem is that in our sinful nature, we are prone to overreactions in any situation, but particularly when wrongdoings have been brought against us. Our sin nature, our human fleshly makeup, we we don't want justice. No, that's not what we want. We may say we want justice, but we don't want justice. No, we want those who have hurt us to hurt more than us. That's what we want. So really, it's not an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. We're taking matters into our own hands, personal retaliation with anger and resentment that leads to extreme, even unthinkable reactions. Jesus says that's not your responsibility. We're not to take matters into our own hands. 
We're not to take the place of governing authorities and enact our own vengeance. In fact, God says many times in his words that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, not yours. No, Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. That doesn't mean that if somebody comes up to you in the parking lot after church because you took their parking spot and they punch you in the right cheek that you with a smile on your face, hey, how about this one too, just to make a match, you know? Jesus is making a point that it would be better to take a second injury than to avenge the first one. Now, you got to think about this, okay? When Jesus says, turn the other cheek, it would be better for you to be hurt twice by the same person than for you to, in response, hurt them the first time. It would be better for a person to malign you a second time than for you to malign them even once. That's the principle. In fact, look at verse 40. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. He's continuing this thought of, of retaliation. Let's consider the language of this verse first because we understand the word coat. The coat is an outer garment, as you see me wearing and some of you wearing today. But what's the cloak? The cloak is an old English word. We don't use it as much anymore, but it was the inner garment. Uh, uh, suffice it to say it's the shirt, okay? Uh, the coat is the coat, and the cloak was a shirt. Now, what we have in contemporary clothing looks greatly different than what they wore in Jesus' day, but I think you still get the point. You have the outer garment, the coat, the inner garment, the shirt. According to Jewish law in terms of legalities, the shirt was an unalienable right of possession. So if someone comes along and sues you and part of their payment was your coat, then you had to be willing to give your shirt also. That's what he's saying. If they ask for the coat, be willing, be willing. He's not commanding it. He's just saying, be willing to give up your shirt. Well, wait a minute. That legally belongs to me. No man can sue me for my shirt. That doesn't matter, Jesus says. The point is, is that it would be better to lose those things that are legally ours than to enter into an unholy feud of spite, resentment, and hostility. So if they come after your coat, Jesus says, be willing to give them your shirt too before going to battle. Now, I don't have time to take you there this morning, but Paul would go into a lot more detail in the book of Corinthians regarding lawsuits and what they are to look like, how we are to respond to them as believers. You have to search these things out for yourself. But it is clear that God is calling us as Christians to live different, to think different, to go beyond the norms, as he would call it here. To go the extra mile. <laughs> you see what he's saying here? What's legally ours, sometimes, we must be willing to forsake. To go the extra mile. For the purpose of gospel witness. Now, well, that's not easy to do. That's why it's called going the extra mile. The first thing he says, extra mile Christians, they don't practice personal retaliation. They don't take vengeance in their own hands. They put the matter into the right authorities. They give it back to God to control. Number two. Extra mile Christians not only, not only resist retaliation, but they exceed demands. They exceed demands. Look at verse 41. Jesus says, and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. Now, there needs to be some cultural explanation here that I think will help you understand that. 
For most of us as Bible students, it's no secret that the Jews were under Roman oppression. They hated each other. One Roman law gave a soldier the right, if he so chooses to do so, to force a civilian to carry his pack for up to a mile. This was a great inconvenience. It was an irritation to the Jews. Not not to mention the insult of having the oppressed to carry the equipment of the oppressors. And so it would be like you walking into a grocery store and a soldier or a police officer or whatever the case may be there looks to you and says, the law requires you to carry my bags as we walk the next mile, and you have nothing to do but to do it. It's the law. You have to do it. And the Romans would always, always do this to the Jewish people. In fact, one uh, historian says, outside of combat, the Roman soldier was probably never more hated than when he forced someone to carry his pack. And so they'd walk up to them, hey, I got a mile to go, you carry my stuff. And you would be forced to carry it. It is similar in the scene that we have when Cyrene, Simeon of Cyrene, was forced to carry the cross of Jesus. The soldiers looked at him and said, you carry the cross. The soldiers could force anybody to carry anything for up to a mile. But the law stated it was only a mile. At the mile, you were no longer under the obligation of the Roman law. But Jesus says, when you are forced to go that mile, be willing and happy to go a second mile. Now, the principle to me is clear. Extra mile Christians willingly go beyond the demands that are given to them, and they accept inconveniences with a servant's spirit. Jesus says, don't be irritated when that soldier asks you to carry his pack. Don't be irritated. I know it's a burden. I know it's an interruption. I know it's an inconvenience. It's a demand that you weren't expecting that day. But don't, don't, don't be irritated. In fact, willingly carry it the mile because that's what the law says to do. And then when you're done with that mile, ask him if he'd like for you to carry it a second. It's kind of like when April the 15th comes around. (laughs) Don't be irritated. Don't be inconvenienced by all the taxes you've got to do. Do what you're supposed to do and be willing to do more if it's called on you to do so. This is difficult, isn't it? And the reason why this is so difficult is because we don't do this very well. (laughs) I don't know about you, but I don't. I don't respond to inconveniences very well. Most type A, perfectionist, planning people never respond well to interruptions. But Jesus comes along and says, not only should you be willing to do it, you should be willing to do it with a servant's heart. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. When you're asked to serve an extra ministry rotation at church or to fill a different role, do you get insulted and irritated? That's not my night to do nursery, but they called me. I guess I got to do nursery. I don't know why they're always calling me. Because probably you're the only one willing to do it. (laughs) I've been an usher for all my life. Now Jared's want me to do this and that. I just, I just don't think I can serve unless I do it the way I've always done it. When your employers place a heavy season of responsibility on you, I dare say that rarely of us respond. Sure, why not? Do you have anything else I can add to my plate while we're at it? <laughs> No, I'd love to work the next five weekends. I have nothing planned, nothing at all. Happy to do it. No, we rarely respond that way. We walk away more frequent than not complaining and irritated about the inconvenience that's been placed upon us. 
That's how we understand verse 41. And we're beginning to see why it's called the extra mile. And why it is that it has been often said that there are no traffic jams on the extra mile. Yet this is what Christ desires for his followers, Christians who willingly and cheerfully exceed the demands that are placed on them, who go the extra mile, even when inconvenienced, without irritation, without insult. Stay with me. Here's a third one. Extra mile Christians, they not only resist personal retaliation, they not only exceed demands, but number three, they practice generosity. They practice generosity. Verse 42, give to him, Jesus says, that asketh thee. And from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. I'll be honest, verses like this can be very tricky to apply in certain scenarios. But the first thing that we need to understand is that the presumption here, I believe, that Jesus is speaking of is that of genuine need. In other words, the one asking here is sincerely in need of assistance. Why is that important? It's important because Scripture does not place on any of us an obligation to meet the selfish and foolish requests that many may approach us about. If you don't believe that, study the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is filled with discernment and prudence and and, and wisdom about who to help and who not to help. This is why we need to prudently understand the needs of people as we discern whether or not their needs are genuine or whether or not their needs are foolish and selfish. When Jesus says, give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow, don't turn him away, this is in direct response to those who have legitimate needs. And by the way, in response to what Jerry's trying to do with our teenagers. This is not one of those things, well, we need you to compensate for our kids who are going to go buy new Xboxes this summer and, and, and do all these things with their money because they can't make it to camp. It's like we as adults sometimes, well, you know what, I don't, I don't have the money to give to the church or to be a blessing to others, but uh, uh, when I get back from Disney World or for the Bahamas or wherever it is I'm going, then, then maybe I can do something. No, the, the matter is not money. The matter is priorities, what we choose to spend them on and recognizing whether or not we have legitimate needs. This is what Jesus is speaking of. And the challenge with such a verse is that Jesus doesn't specifically mandate to us exactly how it is that we can best help these people. The only thing he says is that we should give, look at it, look at it in verse 42, that we should give and not turn them away. That's the only thing he says. Give and don't turn them away. And it's from here that we solidify the principle of generosity. That's what Jesus is speaking of here. Christians who go the extra mile practice generosity. And I will go as far as to say this morning that when it comes to generosity, Christians should always lead by example. The biblical principles and purpose of managing our money wisely is not so that we can live extravagantly, but so that we can give generously. And this includes helping others. Jesus is saying here, don't live tight-fisted. Be open and willing to give to those in need. Manage your life in such a way and your resources that when people come to you and say, I I legitimately need help, that your life has been organized and financially prudent enough that you can actually help people who are in need. I think that's a problem with most of us. And this is not a sermon directly on finances in general, but those of you who attend our financial classes in church long enough have heard me say over and over again that we manage our money to the degree that we don't have anything left to help anybody. And it's not because we're struggling. No, we're house poor. We got mortgages we can't afford. We got payments on vehicles that we don't need. Not only have we subscribed to Netflix, but Amazon Prime and YouTube TV and PlayStation View and all these kind of things. Oh, not to mention Disney Plus is coming out. We 
we pay this bill, we pay that bill. I saw a commercial here recently trying to get the attention of people who don't even know they have bills. How do you live your life in such a way that you're paying so many subscriptions that you don't know what bills you have? But that's our world. And unfortunately, that's the story of too many Christians. It's not that you don't have it. It's that you haven't managed your life in such a way that says, yeah, I could take one of those envelopes. No, the reason why you're not going to take one of those envelopes today is because you don't have the money. You've not thought and lived in terms of generosity. Pastor, I would love to support missions, but you know, we have this, this new Lexus that we bought. And <laughs> That's fine. I'm not trying to take that away from you. But I think with every house you buy, every car you purchase, every subscription you make, every investment you try to play into, at the forefront of your mind ought to always be is this going to help me or hinder me in being generous in people's lives? And if the answer is this is going to hinder me, then it's not the purchase that maybe God would have you make. I appreciate the one amen. That was more than what I was thinking I was going to get. <laughs> How long has it been since you used your resources to genuinely help somebody? You know what the problem with so many of us is? Is we don't mind people giving to our causes. But it's rare that we give back in return. Isn't this going the extra mile? To not only give generously to God what belongs to Him, but to manage our resources in such a way that it is easy for us to be a blessing to others. They practice generosity. And then number four, they love selflessly. They love selflessly. Or you could say they love like Jesus. I actually kind of like that better. They love like Jesus. Look at verse 43. Jesus says, you've heard that it had been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Which, by the way, that statement was another abuse of the law. Look at what he said. Jesus said, you've heard Love the neighbor, hate your enemy. Now, it is true that the second greatest commandment is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But it is not true. It is not true that the law says we are to hate our enemies. The law doesn't say that. But this is what the Pharisees were teaching. This is what the religious leaders were pushing. But then again, we shouldn't be surprised by that because this is how unregenerate minds work. It allows the nature of our flesh to take over and redefine what God intended. And that's exactly what they had done. These religious leaders had limited the word neighbor to only those who were neighborly in return. And anyone who didn't act neighborly could be counted as an enemy. So they concluded in their teaching that we could love those who love us and we were permitted to hate those who don't love us. Which is why Jesus said in verse 46, look at it, if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? How does it benefit you to only love people who love you? In other words, it's not enough to only love those who love you in return. Christian love extends to everyone. In fact, he tells us in the next verse, or the preceding verse, verse 45, that when it comes to loving others, we are to remember whose child we are. Did your parents ever say that to you when you went out somewhere without them? Mine did. Jonathan, remember who you belong to. Remember whose boy you are. That doesn't mean I was ignorant and I might forget who my daddy was. He's telling me to act in such a way that it is a good reflection on him. And that's what Jesus is telling us. Look at verse 45, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. He's not saying that if we do these things, we will become children of the Father. No, he says because we are children of the Father, we need to reflect our heavenly Father. And the reflection here is his love. His love. Who he loves. 
how he loves. He illustrates it for us. Look at verse 45 again. He maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For the longest time I misunderstood this verse, especially the part about the rain. I read it to say that bad things happen to good people. Well, let me say they do. Bad things do happen to good people. But the rain here is not illustrative of that which is bad. In fact, both the sun and the rain, the Lord is using those as pictures of goodness, of blessing. Most of the time we always go to the term rain and we think badly. But rain is a blessing. And the point is our Father's love gives good things to both the just and the unjust. He don't only, he, excuse me, he, he doesn't only bless with rain the goodness on people who are living good, but he blesses his goodness with those who aren't living good. This is theologically true about God. We call this common grace. Common grace. There is sovereign grace, saving grace, redemptive grace that we receive as those who follow him, and I hope you have his redemptive grace in your life. But there is also a common grace that is given to all people regardless of their justification before the Lord. That is to mean that if you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can still say, God is good to me. Well, let's just start with the very fact that you're breathing. You have a family. A job. Maybe you got a raise this week. Maybe a tax return. That's not the goodness of Uncle Sam. That's the goodness of God. <laughs> In fact, Psalm 145, verse 9, it says it like this. Psalm 145, 9. And simple. The Lord is good to all. That's common grace. This is why good things can happen to evil people. Because this is how our Heavenly Father loves. And the principle is this. Don't miss the principle. That if our Father in Heaven does good things to the just as well as the unjust, then we, His children, should live no differently. That we are to love and do good and bless the unjust as much as we do the just. And he describes that in detail for us in verse 44. Look at it. I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. It's pretty clear. Love even those who choose not to love me. Be a blessing to those who have cursed me. Do, do good to the people who make it known that they hate me. Pray constantly for those who mistreat me. This is not normal. And that's the point. Jesus is saying as Christians, you're not to be normal. You're to be different. Salt and light influence on the world. This is the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. Go the extra mile. Show the world there's something different about you. For remember, verse 46, if you love them which love you, what reward have you? If you salute, verse 47, the brethren only. In other words, if you only talk to the brothers and sisters in Christ, how are you, how are you better than anybody else? You're not. It's easy to love those who love us. But we're called to follow the example of our Heavenly Father who expressed love to those who are unloving toward Him. Think about those words from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As they drove the nails in his hands and his feet, that's who he was talking about. Forgive them. They, they don't have any idea what they're doing. 
And Jesus says, live in reflection of your heavenly Father. Go the extra mile. I'll close with this. All ten of these verses this morning present one major message. Are you ready? Here's the major message. Perhaps you'd like to write this down in your notes. The gospel of Jesus Christ transforms our attitude. The gospel of Jesus Christ transforms our attitude. Each of these extra mile ethics, so to speak, are all based in an attitude, a spirit of grace. Think about it. Just rehearse these. Look at them in your notes as I give you a closing statement. An attitude that puts wrongdoings into the hands of the Lord. An attitude that puts wrongdoings into the hands of the Lord. Think of it, an attitude that won't be dictated by inconvenience. An attitude that is happy and active in helping those who are in genuine need. An attitude that chooses to love even those who have maligned and mistreated them. The question is, has your attitude changed? When we talk about the things our parents tell us, I've heard it on more than one occasion and said it to my children a time or two ourselves. You need an attitude adjustment. And we all have our way of adjusting that attitude. I want to tell you something. You, in your own strength, cannot adjust your own attitude. Only the gospel can do that. And when we come to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it changes everything, not just our eternity, but the here and now. How we respond to inconveniences, how we look at those who won't look at us, how we help, how we manage our resources, and so on and so forth. The gospel of Jesus Christ transforms our attitude. Have you experienced that transformation? If so, then go that extra mile. I didn't even get to the last verse. It's verse 48. After telling us to go the extra mile, he says, oh, and by the way, look at it. Be perfect. And we'll talk about that tonight. Let's stand together for prayer, would you please?